Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over to answer this with Joao Giada, who's going to talk today about the intersection between timing and voltage. When we think about timing and voltage, they typically have been totally separate domains in the design cycle. What's changed? What's changed is the continued evolution of uh, designs, Moore's Law. We keep needing to put more transistors on a design, it keeps having to do more, and we've run into fundamental limitations on both what power delivery networks can do and what the processes can deliver. And the way we overcome those is by manipulating the power, and that means the supply voltage we give to these chips, and that's caused a new interesting failure mode that operates at the intersection of the timing and voltage domains. Is this tied to a specific process node, or is this just happening all the way across as we tighten up the margins? Really good question. Um, most people traditionally see this as something that shows up at advanced process nodes. Um, in my opinion, it's a misattribution. People tend to do two steps at the same time. They move to a more aggressive geometry at the same time that they change their architecture and their voltage footprint to harness the performance of that lower node. But it's the fact that they've lowered the amount of power that the chip can consume for doing a particular task that causes the challenge. It's moving closer to threshold voltage of whatever transistors you happen to be operating. So yes, there will happen at seven and five, and most people you know, tend to think of that. For example, if you're in a 28 nanometer ultra low uh, supply uh, process, the same thing will happen, the same problems. Why don't you draw this out for us? Sure. Joao, what are we looking at here? Okay, so we're gonna start from the basics uh, and map up the relationships between timing and voltage, uh, performance and total power, and then we'll go down into the physics of the individual transistors and how all of this interrelates. So most people are aware that when you plot you know, the arc delay across the cell um, as a function of voltage, um, there is a range of operation as long as you're well above threshold voltage where the delay is a relatively narrow function of voltage. The, voltage, the cells are relatively insensitive to small noise on the supply. As you start crossing into close to threshold, near threshold, threshold and sub-threshold operation, this relationship dramatically and drastically changes. Everybody's trying to get to that point now because A, you've got a battery a lot of these devices are operating off of, and B, your trade-offs between power and performance are very tight. You really want to improve both of them at this point. That's correct. So we usually draw that kind of a, as a variant of a bathtub curve. Um, if you plot system, the whole system performance versus its power footprint, on one side, uh, you're dominated by dynamic power. And typically operating on this side of the world for applications that are fundamentally performance limited, HPC, uh, high performance computing, certain forms of AI. And so their power budgets are on this side. You have a different domain where if you slow down performance, trying to lower the total footprint, uh, power footprint, uh, eventually you cross into a leakage dominated domain where because the task is now taking longer, the completion of the task actually consumes more power. And you end up with this kind of behavior and there's an optimal power performance trade-off point where the system uses the minimum possible amount of power to complete its allocated task. And that is ideally the sweet spot that's being targeted. And it actually is very variable. It depends very much on what your system architecture looks like, what the task you're trying to achieve, and there's various trade-offs. One of the complicating factors here is, is now you're trying to run algorithms sometimes all the time, always on. At the same time, you have very heterogeneous architectures that are coming in as well, so not everything is at the same node. Uh, you've got a lot of things that are going on and off at different times. Is that correct? That's correct. And that's why all of a sudden treating these as two independent domains is no longer a legitimate way of looking at system. You have to deal with the interactions of heterogeneous domains. 
Um, for example, one of the reasons why there are big little uh, ARM architecture. Sometimes it's cheaper to have a big core, high performance core active for a shorter amount of time than having a very power efficient core alive longer. But that causes very different challenges on how the power grid behaves and what noise you're going to see on that power grid. And that causes interactions with timing that if you haven't seen the system, it is the multi-physics simulation, you will have gaps in your coverage of problems that escape through traditional methodologies. What are the key bottlenecks you have to keep in mind here? Fundamentally, there's two types of bottlenecks you have to deal with. On one side is the ability of your power grid to supply power down to the individual transistors uh, that are actually doing the work. Um, this comes into play on, typically under high performance conditions where it's almost impossible to supply sufficient power to all the transistors that you have to turn on at the same time. Uh, it's one of the reasons why we have dark silicon. Not everything can be awake. You're fundamentally limited by the, the ability of the power network to deliver power. But just equally as important is that even under conditions where not under high power stress, when you're starting to operate in this power optimized domain where you're leakage or closer to leakage dominated, where you're at the balancing edge, the relationship between timing and voltage is extremely steep. So any noise on the power delivery network caused by activity elsewhere may have a significant impact on whether this part can actually perform according to spec. There's a couple other things that have changed here too, one of which is that algorithms are now being written, written much sparser than what they were in the past, so they're more susceptible to potential noise as well, right? And the second thing is that within your communication, you're trying to move more data at the same time. That's right. Um, and this is why you have multiple tools in this domain, right? We have, for example, tools like Power Artist uh, and that family of tools to analyze system from the high level perspective and to figure out how the allocation of power and what are the interesting vectors that are going to cause challenges at the implementation, at the, uh, the physical implementation layer. There's also why we have built a scalable platform to be able to do this large scale analysis and identify corner cases on the behavior of individual transistors that are going to cause challenges. So what are you hearing from your customers that say, we've gone wrong here? Well, the first generation of customers discovers this with silicon failures. Uh, and that's when they come and engage us. Our industry, whilst is always in the middle of rapid change, is inherently conservative. We tend not to like to bring in new steps into our methodologies or new challenges into the design domain unless we have to. The trigger for we have to is that the previous methodology broke. We are at such an inflection point now. And we used to have a roadmap. This was exactly what you're talking about, right? Where now we don't have that roadmap anymore. It's become much more challenging. Um, one of the interesting things that's happened actually with the industry consolidation is everybody ended up specializing. It's a lot harder to share information because you have people focused entirely on, say, mobile applications. People focused on high performance AI. Some people are focusing on edge AI. Um, everybody is segregated into their own domains of knowledge and it's harder to see trends um, early. So what's the solution? How, where do we go forward? Our view, and uh, we have some data to back that this is a, a relevant approach, is to bring all the data together and analyze it at once. And instead of having blind margins that may or may not be safe and you don't know, by doing the appropriate relevant simulations, you have confidence that under the analyzed conditions, the system is going to operate exactly as expected. So now you're architecting around data as opposed to around what you typically did in the past, right? Exactly. Um, what we did in the past worked, let me on. But it was based on engineering rules of thumbs. My previous design operated correctly with 
a 10 millivolt guard band. So that's the target for my next design. And I don't actually care where that number came from in, to a certain extent. I just make sure that my system delivers to 10 millivolts. 10 millivolts may or may not be too high on a design that suddenly is operating at a different voltage regime. 10 millivolts is a very healthy uh, guard band if you're working at, say, 0.8 volts. Um, if you're operating at 0.5 volts, it's a huge amount of my headroom. Um, it may no longer be reliable or viable to produce the design with that much guard band. And I don't even know if that's the guard band I'm actually going to be using, whether it's even safe. The only way to be sure is to provide those numbers to the timing tool and interact them. And the challenge there is that this is purely physical simulation effects. This is not something that is amenable to the standard abstract timing models we currently have. Can you elaborate on that? Sure. So our traditional timing model is a black, non-physical black box that models the delay effect of a cell. It doesn't even have a power supply. It's primarily modeling abstract delay. Uh, current source models or otherwise. It's just an abstract delay model. In practice, you know, just drawing a simple inverter, um, it has a power rail, has a ground rail, both of which are noisy. You can't abstract this into a single supply number, uh, commonly called defective uh, VDD, because if my supply rail drops, it affects a rise waveform um, different than a fall waveform. On a fall waveform, if I drop the rail, my transistor starts switching, or apparently starts switching earlier. It can even be helpful at the beginning. So what I'm trying to get to is that the abstraction that has worked safely and well in prior generations where we were well away from the relatively predictable voltage delay response that was relatively linear, is unsuitable for this highly exponential regime where they're at near threshold and sub-threshold. So this is a simple drawing. How do you do this at design scale, which is just enormous these days? Um, well, the truth is that you can't in a traditional old style platform. This is why ANSYS has invested so heavily in these scalable distributed compute platforms that are high, you know, highly uh, scalable for doing detailed simulations. That is our forte. This is where we bring value to the table. We can solve these problems in a reasonable amount of resources, reasonable amount of time, and give you answers that allow you to decide, is my design safe? It would work as I expect. Is the, the data that comes out of these that you're working with, is that consistent? Is it put into an orderly way that it can all be used, or does it have to uh, also be translated? To a certain extent, that's in flight. Um, different customers adopt different strategies. Yes, we have a way we present, but the tool is highly customized uh, because it has to fit into people's individual flows. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's such a heterogeneity and specialization within the customer base, the our tool has to fit into what the customer's environment actually looks like. It, we only deliver value when we can fit into a customer's design environment and allow that customer in their environment with the least perturbation to their engineering base uh, to observe these properties of their design and make the determination, is it safe? Do I have room to optimize? Can I make it better? Will I be done in time? So rather than just the process node, it's also where these chips are going to be used in the hierarchy of computing too, right? So closer to the endpoint and the edge is going to be different than further in on an edge server, which is different than the cloud. Exactly. And one of the interesting things that happened in the, in the resurgence of design is the entry of, actually the re-entry of systems. Um, we have a lot more designs that are targeted at systems. They never live in isolation. Um, I mean, the canonical example early on was Apple, but you're seeing that across the board, whether it's Apple's, Google's, Microsoft's. Everybody is 
creating silicon, not as a generic vehicle, but as a specific targeted solution to a problem because everybody is power constrained, whether you live in an HPC farm or whether you're inside a car. It, you're power constrained, you're perf uh, performance constrained, you're dealing with real world performance constraints that you have to be able to respond to events in a particular amount of time and a particular amount of energy. And when you have this system level of an understanding of a problem, there's also more vectors of exploration because you have the total design space in mind. You're not just producing a generic chip uh, of unqualified use. And one of the problems here is that almost all those designs that you're talking about are very customized. They're customized to use cases. They're customized to specific markets. Do the tools that work across these, is there enough generalities that you can say this will work in every case? Is that the same problem that is horizontal or are they unique? is it unique for each one? That's where the analysis at scale uh, plays into and having kind of the wealth of analysis tools. Um, we. Yes, you have to analyze each of these specific use cases in detail and make a determination both from the system perspective and how is the software going to impact what is actually going to be seen in the implementation and then take that information, that detailed information about what are the interesting set of vectors, what are the interesting scenarios and pass that down to the lower level analysis and close the physical loop on those to make sure that for the things that this design cares, for this specific system use case, it will perform as expected. Will this get more difficult as we move into more advanced packaging, chiplets, 2.5D, things like that? Depends on the meaning of the word difficult. Difficult for us technologists implementing it? Sure. For the customer, um, the model remains similar. Uh, it just brings a little bit more wealth of models that interact with each other. Joao Giada, thanks for a really interesting conversation. You're most welcome. Thank you.